legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Paul Devereaux, who joins us to discuss his book, Powers of Ancient and Sacred Places. The book provides an informed, wide-ranging survey of a variety of intriguing properties of ancient sites, ranging from the material to the subtle. These enigmatic monuments are where we come face to face with our human story through time, the places of power that gave us our first sense of the holy. Topics discussed include why humans are drawn to certain sites and to erect sacred structures there, archaeoacoustics, exploring the sound of the past, modern electromagnetism and how it disrupts our subtle senses, strange light phenomena and UFOs, how consciousness may interact with paranormal phenomena, and sensory archaeology, exploring power places using psychometry, dreams and numinosity. Hello and welcome Paul and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you Greg, good to be here. Uh, Paul, you've got a new book just coming out at the moment uh, that's entitled um, Powers of Ancient and Sacred Places. Now, it does have some material in it dating back um, historically, which has been updated uh, with your latest um, information and research. Uh, before we dive into that, just tell listeners a little bit about your background, your work in general, and then just explain uh, what the new book is in terms of its uh, content. Well, the book itself... Uh really rides on the back of a book I wrote 30 years ago called Places of Power. Uh, and uh, this brings that up to date. So we use segments of that first book. And then, as you say, we bring it up to date because a lot has happened and whole new sections have come in uh, on sound and uh, uh, various other features that were never even dreamt about when I was writing the other book. So it's very up to date, and I say it's up to date. It was actually written about eighteen months ago, uh, but we had COVID stops and lockdowns, and goodness knows what that slowed its appearance and slowed its actual publication. But anyway, it's out now. And what I, me personally, this is a one aspect of my work and life. Uh, I also was uh, founding editor of uh, time, uh, time and Mind Journal, which is an academic journal, uh, but dealing with the lesser dealt with aspects of ancient places, ancient landscapes, ancient sites uh, at an academic level. And I'm also an artist, a photographer. The first time I came across your work was your book Stone Age Soundtracks, which I found absolutely fascinating. What we'll touch upon the subject matter of that a little bit in due course. But essentially, I've said a bit in the recorded introduction about places of power, what, what we mean when we say this. Uh, these can be naturally occurring, uh, man-made sometimes, uh, you know, naturally occurring and augmented mm -hmm. by, by humans over time. But perhaps you could just expand on that a little bit from your perspective, because it's something that, as you say, you've been working on in one form or another for a long time. And it always made complete sense to me because... Um, you know, the earth is, is saturated with energy of all types. You know, everything is energy, really. Life is energy. Um, but we, we live in a very, currently, anyway, for in recent couple of centuries, in a very sort of disenchanted world uh, mm -hmm. where, where these energies are, are, are perhaps too subtle for most people. So perhaps you could just, as I say, expand on that a little bit. Well, what I do in the book and what I've been doing in my research with a lot of other people <coughs> is uh, I've... Um, divided the book into two areas. One is physical energies and the anomalies. Uh, and the other are other kinds of power which involve things like direct primary sensing, 
dream work, numinosity, and so on. Uh, but in the physical energies, we're looking at natural radioactivity, the background radioactivity, magnetism, seismic faulting, and associated phenomena like curious light phenomena, and sound, which has been a big area of my actual research, uh, archaeoacoustics, uh, for a good many years. Uh, and uh, these are all properties, powers, if you like, of sites that people never even realized for a long while, and some are only just beginning to be uh, identified. And they have their own archaeology, if you like, um, uh, and we, uh, if they were properly followed. So it's a question of the book pointing them out and giving examples and going into the details of things. So if you say something like, I don't know, natural radioactivity, uh, people say, well, you know, Stone Age people, they never had Geiger counters and so on. Uh, but as I show in the book, that it really isn't a, isn't a problem. Uh, these things have radioactive properties in some cases. Not all. We're, we're really selecting particular sites that have these properties or powers. Uh, magnetism is the same. People say, ah, oh, you know, there's no way they knew about magnetism. And that is wrong because they had things like lodestone and so on. It's a physical thing, but also it's being increasingly understood that human beings and certainly other creatures can respond to magnetic environments. Uh, and we've probably toned our, da our uh, sensitivity to it down because the world is of the present world is awash with magnetic energies and other energies. And seismic faulting, there definitely seems to be an association between megalithic sites and uh, faulted terrain. Uh, but the faulting, not only uh, that association, uh, but the implications that come with that, because such places have a lot of magnetic disturbance, faulting causes all sorts of things. And they, in turn, are associated with... Uh, very curious light phenomena. And sound, finally, is a, is a fairly new area of, of research. Uh, it's just becoming uh, accepted by the mainstream archaeologists, only just. Uh, and uh, it has many ramifications. Well, we'll come to some of those individual areas in a bit more detail shortly. But we we don't need we never needed uh, Geiger counters in order to to sense radiation as you, as you've hinted at. I mean mm. we rely on scientific instruments, you know, as they've been developed uh, for so many things. But I mean we were always sensitive to radiation, magnetism, you know, sound, light, you name it. That's I mean that's our our five senses and 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 you know those possibly potentially beyond which you dip into. In the second part of the book, I mean that 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 was those were our scientific instruments. You know, it from for the longest time, uh, the species was on the Earth. So I, I find it strange that someone would say something that they they were not aware of such and such a, a naturally occurring force because they didn't have a little black box or whatever to to tell them that <laughs> it was there. You know, absolutely. Oh yeah, I mean, if, if you think about it, back in prehistory, the world was a much energetically speaking, a much quieter place. And people were much more attuned, if you like, to the environmental factors. You lived in a rainforest somewhere, you'd know about all the plants, which ones could heal, which ones would uh, alter, mind, alter your mind, uh, all sorts of things like that. In other environments, you would be aware of, in, in your body, uh, or in your mind, of areas that had, uh, if you like, radioactive properties. And, and the rocks themselves, of course, are, are radioactive in some cases, granites particularly. I was inside the uh, King's Chamber uh, and monitored with a Geiger counter uh, the radiation in there, and it's pretty high, it's about five times the background level of the desert around. Uh, and it's because the place is clad in granite, that's one granite. And 
un invisible in above the roof are great blocks of granite with spaces in between. Very curious uh, arrangement of architectural arrangement. Uh, and uh, granite puts out uh, uh, radon and so on, and it accumulates, and you get uh, uh, quite a, a, a a radioactive background. We're not talking, you know, Three Mile Island or Chernobyl or anything. Uh, quite a, a dense background radiation level. At the outset of the book, I mention um, the Dragon Project. That we did a lot of field work and research on physical energies, amongst others, at ancient sites, mainly uh, Stone Age megalithic sites but not exclusively so. And also I, I have a chapter, well, an introduction actually, called Tales of Power. Uh, and in that we look at both modern ideas of people who think they can sense things, uh, electrical current off a stone or whatever, and also the, the huge, long tradition in folklore of there being unusual properties or agencies at standing stones and stone circles and and all the rest of it. Uh, so there is a background to this, both ancient and modern. And as far as radioactivity goes, um, we measured, every, you know, a lot of the sacred waters are radioactive, like the, the springs at Bath are radioactive, uh, lightly radioactive, but definitely. And there's association in some areas with, with, radioactive waters and healing. This was true also in ancient Greece. Uh, so there's all this stuff I've tried to bring together, gather together, and uh, show how these are powers that ancient places have, uh, and that we should be really looking at those in their own terms, as I say, in archaeology of these things. Now, in terms of... Um of the earth and uh, you know the wider solar system and indeed you know, the rest of the galaxy and the cosmos electrical energy is it, you know it's not a, a a human invention but in terms of this thing that you referred to you know about this um this sort of energetic soup that we all swim in these days and you know in most of the world anyway do, do you think it was the, the the sort of harnessing of electricity and the developing development of um, electrical devices that was a, some, a sort of a turning point in all this? You know, what would you point to when the, the noise levels started to, to really interfere mm. with our, our, our natural, uh, you know, interaction with, with, with Earth energies? Oh, yeah, well, the entire development of the modern world puts out a sea of radio signals, electrical vibrations, microwave radiation, and all the rest of it. And we swim in it, you know, switch your radio on, uh, say a, a portable radio and you can pick up radio stations they were there before you turned your radio on they're all mussing around and i think we've dampened down our sensitivity to certain natural forces uh in order to survive really but some people still some people for example are very electrically sensitive uh, uh, all sorts of things, and uh, it's the same with magnetism. Uh, everywhere there is, we sit. I'm sitting in front of a computer now, and it's beaming all sorts of stuff out at me. <laughs> uh, and uh, we 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 take it for granted in the modern world that it's a different world to the one that Stone Age people, for example, moved in. In terms of our um, abilities to tune in to these energies being degraded, to what extent do you think that what the balance might be between um, a, a biological component of that, you know, just our physical bodies being affected by man-made energies, and to what extent do you think it might be a, a you know, a, a cultural or psychological thing? You know, we've lost touch with the idea of sensing these things. You know, no one believes that they they exist or that it's possible to do that anymore. Well, it's not that the powers, uh, the energies themselves have been degraded. It's, yeah, it's just our receptivity of them. Uh, we, it, we, we're less finely tuned, if you like. Some people still are, but by and large, culturally, we are not. Uh, and uh, it, we recede from it like we are from nature in all sorts of ways. Uh, and we don't need it, if you like, now. 
in earlier days, perhaps it was a sensitivity that was important to survival, for example. Uh, but the point is, you can go to these places uh, and you'll find that there are stones that are magnetic, uh, for example, or that are issuing radon radiation, uh, uh, or on um, places. For example, there was a, there's a standing stone near the Callanish group of stones on the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. And you won't think anything, I don't guess a standing stone on a hillside overlooking the main site. But recent work with uh, geophysical um, surveys shown that the standing stone is actually was a survivor of a whole ring of stones. Uh, and then they found in the center, underneath the peat, the peat covering in the bare bedrock, was a huge physio, huge star-like break in the in the the uh, in the bedrock and that was it had been caused by a bolt of lightning or several bolts of lightning or other weird electrical phenomena atmospheric phenomena uh, and uh, it's hard to believe uh, and it's right in the center of, of this ring of stones and it's hard to believe that uh, it's there by accident uh, and we know that in some parts of the world, uh, light phenomena, for example, people in China and in India and elsewhere, they actually built temples because lights and odd phenomena were seen. And they were given the cultural dressing of their day. If, they were, if you're in China, it was interpreted as a bodhisattva light. Uh, uh, or, or in India, it was a, a goddess or god. Uh, lurking around with a lantern or whatever. In Celtic countries, it was fairies, uh, fairy lights, literally, uh, and so on. So each had its cultural niche, but they were the same phenomena. Well, okay, so peoples in the past it, 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 you know, imposed their ideas or they, 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 they came up with their interpretations of these phenomena, what they might be witnessing, what might be going on. And as was, you know, tendency back then, they, they imbued them with qualities that, that in the modern age we wouldn't. But are most, are many peoples are certainly the lack of curiosity in the scientific age, if we can put it like that, about many of these things is rather strange because you were talking about archaeoacoustics, uh, you know, listening to the past, basically, uh, you know, grudgingly being accepted and, and creeping into you know, the outer reaches of the mainstream. But I've always found that the, the, the dismissal of these phenomena, I, you know, either that it didn't happen. Oh, yeah, people saw it, but it didn't happen. Or if it did, it means nothing. Or the the kicker for me is that, oh, well, this can all be explained scientifically. And it's like, okay, well, explain it scientifically then. Well, we can't, but it can all be explained scientifically. You know, this sort of circular thinking. But the bottom line being, you know, if it doesn't fit in a very uh, narrow um, paradigm of what's possible, even if it's observed, then it well, it, it's, it didn't happen. Yes, uh, yes, to a degree, I, I agree with that. Um, if people can't take it at face value. Uh, that there are okay, the stone will spin a compass, or this pile of rocks is, is magnetic, or gives off radon gas, or whatever. And perhaps people would sit there to have visions and so on. It happened to us on the Dragon Project near the Rollwright Stones, where there's a strip of, of radi higher radiation. Um, and uh, several people reported quite independently, having basically what we would call hallucinations, that in perhaps another age would be called visions. Uh, it, how people reacted to them. Uh, now we... we we just overlook them, basically. The sound is different to a degree because, as I say, this can actually be studied and you can still experience it at certain places. So it's a question. It, this whole area of physical energies at certain types of, of, of sacred sites uh, really, as I say, needs its own archaeology. It needs to be looked at as a whole. I'm not saying oh, it doesn't exist or it doesn't matter. It mattered if people built a ring of stones around somewhere where a bolt of lightning or whatever 
struck uh, and rent the ground uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, there was a case, uh, 1919 even, uh, writing in English, the English mechanic, this guy T. Sington and a colleague were coming down, they were hill walking in Helvellyn, I think. Anyway, they were coming back down uh, after a day of, of hill walking and passed close to uh, the Castle Rig Stone Circle, magnificent stone circle in the Lake District. And on the way down, it was getting dark, and suddenly they, they could see these lights moving to and fro above the uh, the Castle Rig Circle. And they stopped and looked, and I said, well, what's that? Uh, and uh, one of the lights broke away and started coming towards them. And uh, Sington said it was about six feet across, uh, and it was just above head high and coming towards us. And we, you know, suddenly started feeling a bit nervous about this. And when he got close to them, he just flickered and went out. Now he said something very interesting, and I think this is the the key to it. If you'll pardon me, I like to. I can't remember his actual words. Suppose, owing to some local condition at present unknown, such lights have occurred from time to time near the site, they would have attracted the attention of the inhabitants who, awestruck, might then have selected the site as a place of worship or sacrifice. And that was, let's say, 1990, a long while ago, but I think it's still a relevant observation. And that's really the key. That's where the archaeology, if you like, lies. Uh, with the study of, of energies at, at uh, ancient sites. It's also what made them magical or sacred or whatever. Uh, uh, then again, uh, the different Ardudwi dolmen, not far from Harlech in Wales, there were, in 1905, there was an outbreak of light phenomena uh, that locals thought it was to do with uh, a religious renewal. But in fact, it was uh, just an outbreak of really incredibly odd lights that were well documented. We were able to exactly place them uh, because of the documentation of the day uh, in association with the Mokras Fault, which runs exactly there. And say, uh, and various ancient sites are scattered along there as well. One of them, this Dufferin Ardudwi Dolman, uh, I'm sure that's not the way you say it in Welsh, but anyway, it's the way it looks. Uh, people saw beams, columns of light come straight out of the ground alongside this dolmen, uh, which was basically on the Mokras fold. And these light beams shot up into the air and then sort of a smoky effect at the top before they faded away. Uh, and there was a number of cases like this where there was direct correlation with a site and, and with light phenomena and a, a general association with seismicity. So we're going to all that in, in the book in a lot more detail, of course. Well, you mentioned earlier folklore and, um, you know, sort of, th and, and legends and, and themes and motifs within those. Uh, which yeah. again, a lot of people take to be, uh, well, you know, just even though they all have an origin, you trace them back, even fairy tales tend to have a, a basis in, in some form of reality. The meaning of myth is not simply what many people take it to be, which is just something that's made up. That's not the case. But, and how these could be connected to some of these phenomena. And you, you mentioned the word, you know, visions, uh, as it might have been a word used in centuries and millennia gone by for something that someone might report as having had a strange dream, you know, in our modern age, perhaps if they, you know, stayed over a megalithic site, for example, or one of these other power places, they would say, well, something very odd happened last night. And they would have a certain spin on that based on their worldview, you know, their understanding of things. That's in, right. In the past, it'll it may have been very different. Yeah, it'll be culturally uh uh, encased, if you like. A good example is um, the Carningley Peak in the Priscilla Hills, uh, very close to where the Blue Stones of Stonehenge originated. Uh, and the peak of Carningley, the Hill of Angels, uh, is uh, is powerfully magnetic anomaly there. It'll actually spin you, even if you hold the compass in mid-air, 
the compass needle will spin around and point south or go swing around aimlessly. Uh, and it was there that the uh, Dark Ages uh, saint, Saint Brenach, in the 6th century, would occasionally go from his cell, which was not far away, uh, and, and go walk up there. And it said he would sit there and talk to angels. Now, my guess would be that what the magnetism uh, affected his brain, certain parts of the brain are particularly sensitive to magnetic environment, uh, and 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 have visions of, of angels. Uh, hence the name Khan Ingli, angel. Uh, so uh, it's exactly, it was, everything is, is and places like fairies, uh, the Fae. Uh, in in Ireland, for example, uh, often occur at places where lights are seen, and the lights are taken to be the fae, the fairies, uh, and we go into that quite a lot. Well, I did a show a while back with Dr. Rick Strassman over in the US, who's done a lot of yeah, c- yes, yes. controlled work with DMT, as you're obviously aware of. Right. And in his yeah. his book, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, he talks about you know, things like the, in the biblical stories, like the burning bush and. All these other things are considered uh, miraculous, uh, but you know, obviously, to us, physically impossible. May have been somehow connected uh, here as well. That you know, there may have been a, a, some sort of, if, if not psychedelic, then some kind of psychoactive effect on individuals or groups experiencing these things. Uh, there's also another little book I read recently by a regular guest of mine, Bernardo Castro, and it's called Meaning and Absurdity, and he details lots of, uh, not just these, but you know, lots of. Um, Situation, historic, well recorded and documented historical situations, uh, events where groups, and sometimes very large groups of people witnessed just absolutely bizarre, you know, what looked like supernatural paranormal phenomena, including one particular one. I can't remember the name of it where a large group of people watched the sun fall from the sky and plunge into the ocean. Yeah. Um, uh, things like that. Is that what they actually saw? We don't know, but the point is something was going on and they all saw the same thing. And I think the, the earth lights aspect of this, I think it's a book of title of a book of yours from 1982 is one of the most fascinating aspects to me because I've always been interested in. Uh, the UFO phenomenon, you know, what is it that, you know, what are these lights in the sky? What can they be? And I think that your work adds a lot to that in terms of, of, um, of possibilities. Yeah. And then people, you know, die hard extraterrestrial, uh, believers, uh, get very, very annoyed with me and people like me. I said, well, you're just explaining to me scientifically. Well, no. Uh, the phenomena is still an unknown quantity. It's some sort of exotic plasma, and it seems to have some very exotic effects. Like people can see the light from one side and not from the other. Uh, and it's, uh, I think there it's a sort of macro-quantal effects, uh, but I can't prove that. I just know it's true. <laughs> no, uh, the, um, you see, we put our belief system on as well. Uh, in the modern show, the UFOs that come from outer space or whatever, or the interdimensional. That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com. <laughs>